So, introduce our first speaker. Just give a few of your credentials and give the floor. You've been you've been in this field for about a, more than a decade, actually, starting in student student activism and student governance when you were still a student. You worked at the Democratic Society, or probably even in Brussels. Uh, greatest city on the planet, I would say, but I'm from Brussels, so I um, so worked with Democratic Society. You worked on the first Scottish Citizen Assembly. You were the lead facilitation designer for the Scottish Climate Assembly. Now you're uh, lead for deliberative democracy at TPX Impact. And you will tell us a bit about the Scottish Climate Assembly, but also uh, a more about framing remit and, and topics, etc. And also the, the interesting story, what if you organize such a thing as a wedding, which is a, an assembly and then a global pandemic, uh, you, you also had some interesting conditions whilst you had to do it. The floor is yours, Kelly. Indeed. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Uh, everyone. So as you've said, my name is Kelly McBride. I am just going to test this. That's me. Very big face. Um, so I have been working on citizens assemblies and deliberative processes since about 2015, but very much more broadly um, around participatory democracy for a number of years beyond that. And as you heard, I've been involved in a few different processes, in including uh, citizens' assemblies in Scotland, and I'm currently working on local climate assemblies as well in the UK. And as I'm talking, I am going to talk quite generally around uh, framing and around remits and around questions. But I'm going to pepper it with a few case examples, so some from the work that I've done in Scotland and also uh, a London borough that I'm currently working with. So. There's a few words that you're going to hear me say, and this is the most basic way that I uh, tend to try and explain them. I'll be potentially talking about mandates. So mandates, to me, are where has the initiative for this citizens' assembly come from? Mandates are sometimes set politically. They may come through legislation. The initiative for an assembly might even come bottom up from our community. So when I talk about mandate, I'm talking about the initiative. When I'm talking about the remit, really what I'm talking about is what the focus of the process is going to be. That could be something quite broad. You might just want to talk about climate change, but we're going to dig into that a little bit. Or it might be something more specific. For example, you want to look at mobility in your city. You might want to look at air quality or another kind of tangible issue connected to climate change. So that's what I mean when I say remit in this presentation. And that very much informs and is often included in your question. And this question is the thing that you often see put out there. It's the public facing explanation of what your assembly is about sometimes. Uh, and that's the specific guiding and framing question that your assembly focuses on. So you can imagine when you get in the room with your participants, you are every single time sharing that question and reminding people that this is what you're focusing on as you're going through your process. So why am I talking to you about this? Why are we starting here? The remit, your question, are incredibly important because they guide essentially everything that is going to come um, through your assembly process. That includes communicating the purpose and the focus of the process to the people taking part, to decision makers, to any stakeholder that you're trying to basically bring along on the journey of the assembly. So it really communicates what it is that you're doing and are trying to do. It very much guides the development of the evidence and the learning journey that people in your process are going to go on. So you can practically imagine that just as you're starting to design your assembly, you're bringing together a group of people that might help you to develop the evidence. And the starting point has to be them being very clear on the focus uh, of your process, what the remit is, and some of that guiding questions so that you can then develop your evidence base in line with that. And then it's also really important to inform the shape of recommendations because you should expect that if you ask a particular question that you will get recommendations at the end that respond to that question. Um, but as we're here, as we go through this, it's not as straightforward as that. And when people get in a room, sometimes they have different expectations. So when should you be doing your or setting your mandate and your remit and setting your questions? Um, so setting your question, you absolutely have to have done it before uh, you go into things like recruitment, really, and really setting up your assembly. Um, and alongside setting your question, you would expect to do things like develop your comm strategy. At the back of the room, there is some guidance from the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies that talks about all of these different stages in more detail. But before you can 
set your question, you really need to be clear on your mandate and the remit uh, by this stage and have developed a few key messages around what that remit is. And there's all sorts of reasons why you need to do that, not least getting the buy-in and the understanding of decision makers who at the end may involve be involved in looking at the recommendations and coming up with some kind of response. But we do know, and I think this is a message we heard a little bit earlier, um, is that citizens' assemblies work best when they're tasked with dealing with issues that have distinct trade-offs and where politicians have been unable or willing to act. So you really need to give some thought to the purpose of the citizens' assembly, why it is you're doing an assembly as your starting point, and try to ensure that you're doing an assembly process around issues that really have some trade-offs that have been really difficult to grapple with. Because bringing these citizens together for thousands of hours of times deliberating uh, as we heard, is no kind of easy feat, but it's one that's really important and has fantastic outcomes if you do it well. Um, and a little bit later, I'm going to be touching on some other guidance that's been produced by the Knowledge Network and Climate Assemblies at the back of the room um, from some colleagues around guiding principles for setting the remit of a climate assembly. So I think as we're going into our group work a little bit later on, please do draw on some of the resources at the back of the room because there's brilliant information that people who have worked on these processes across Europe have spent some time bringing together. Okay, so I'm going to start here. This is a huge, and I think lively debate, when it comes to climate assemblies and citizens' assemblies in general. Do we set remits that are pretty broad? So maybe we're getting people together to talk about the general challenges around climate change and the things that they want to see happen. And I'll talk about some of the benefits and some of the issues with both of these in a moment. Or do we want to be more specific? Is there a particular aspect of climate change that we really want our assemblies to focus on? And the reason why I say it's a lively debate is because um, people who are practitioners, I think, have some strong opinions about how uh, easy it is to design uh, depending on whether you go broad or specific. I can certainly tell you it's easier when you go specific. But there's also debate around the impact of recommendations that come out of the end, making sure that commissioning organisations kind of have the power to act around them or maybe in your wider community. Um, but there's also, I think, in wider and broader civil society, an interest and an urge to talk more broadly about kind of systematic changes and bigger issues around climate change and how different things link. So broader remits, maybe in that context, might be favourable. There isn't one way that you absolutely have to go and are advised to go. Both of them have some pros and some cons. Another thing that you could also do is uh, you can take options that are already known to assembly settings um, and present those options. But again, bear in mind that assemblies work best when there really are uh, clear trade-offs to be made. OK, broad. So what are some of the benefits of going broad? Well, you can explore systematic and cross-cutting issues. Um, when we did the Climate Assembly in Scotland, we definitely had a broad question, and I'll show you that later. But that meant that people in that setting were able to talk about the social, the political, and the economic aspects of climate change, as well as specific issues around things like work and travel uh, and other kind of more uh, specific issues of climate change. We talked about how participants can be involved in direction setting. So in that broad space, that means that you can get people together and they can maybe give a little bit of direction about the kinds of issues they would want to talk about. And as a practitioner, you can be responsive to that. Um, I will say, of course, that's quite uh, difficult, particularly if you have condensed timelines, because being respons uh, responsive in an assembly setting means that you're needing to go out and bringing more evidence uh, and more information based on where people's interests lie, and that takes a bit of time. Developing general climate literacy of the participants and broader public. Again, that could be a benefit because you're talking about climate change in a really general sense and people are able to kind of pursue paths that are interesting to them. Exploring the complexities and independencies of different issues. It's true, climate change is a, a complex topic. It's not all black and white. Sometimes you do need to talk about social, political, economic drivers when addressing it. Uh, this gives a bit more of a space to do that than talking about it really specifically. Uh, and giving a general sense of public interest in addressing climate issues is something that policymakers have said is interesting. Um, but coming on to some of the challenges uh, or the issues around this, Honestly, often the remit is just too broad. It is absolutely massive, and it takes so much hard work as someone designing these processes to come up with a really 
coherent design that ensures that you have a fair balance of information, bearing in mind that if you're just talking about climate change in general, there are so many different paths that you can go down. So that usually means in practice that you bring together um, a group to help you develop the evidence and you have to work with that group to come up with some kind of framework that makes sense to them. And maybe sometimes you need to bear in mind um, other stakeholders in doing that too. Um, we find that broad assemblies are rarely aligned with policy windows to enable policy impact. What I mean by that is that if you're doing something really specific, say in your city you're about to develop some kind of strategy around air quality, you can uh, develop a citizens' assembly that's going to align with the window that will enable people to really influence the development of that strategy. When you go broad, you're not necessarily sure what kind of policy issues might come out at the end. So the window of influence is a little bit more uncertain. So that has some implications for the impact of the assembly, but it's still not to say that it's not important to do. There's no guarantee that you'll be uh, able to directly address known challenges and issues head on, although that could be politically convenient. It could be difficult to design and select evidence driven by time constraints in the process. So I've mentioned a little bit about that. And recommendations that sit outside the scope of the commissioner is certainly something that we come on. But I will say, from my perspective, that is a general issue with assemblies because uh, we can't assume that people in our assembly settings understand how decisions are made, how power works, and how our institutions work. Um, so that's a, a slightly separate issue, but connected to this too. And some examples of broad remits. Here are some questions up here, although one has been cut off somehow. Um, so for example, Ireland's Citizens' Assembly asked how the state can make Ireland a leader in tackling climate change, pretty broad. Scotland's Climate Assembly, the one uh, that I worked on, was how should Scotland tackle the climate emergency in a fair and effective way? And one of the things that I'm gonna uh, talk about just at the end is how we got to that question and why it was so broad. And then um, there's also one there from Germany that's been cut off, which was how do we shape climate policy? Good for us, good for our environment, and good for our country. But there are tons of different examples out there, and again, some of that is in the guidance at the back if you want to have a look. And just focusing on that Scotland question for a second, I mentioned earlier um, that a thing with a broad remit is that you have to give a lot of thought to how you then bring it together into a cohesive design and come up with the different areas that you're going to explore, because with a question like that, you could technically explore absolutely any aspect of the climate emergency. And this is how it ended up in Scotland, because it was so broad. Um, and this was a process where members came together for seven weekends, uh, over 100 people, and we ended up having to split them into three different work streams to be able to work with this massive remit. Um, so we looked at one around diet, land use, and lifestyle, one stream around home and communities, and one stream around travel and work. And what happened at the beginning is everyone worked together around a general introduction to climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. One thing I will flag around remit and assembly se uh, question setting at the moment is that we find a lot of the questions are really lending ourselves to recommendations that come out uh, with recommendations around mitigation. Um, we're seeing a bit of a challenge uh, around assemblies coming up with uh, recommendations around adaptation when questions are quite broad. So I would just flag that if you are interested in exploring adaptation in particular, uh, you might want to give some careful thought to the framing of the question and how that's included. Um, but anyway, we had this general introduction and then uh, we looked at why we set targets, where Scotland's emissions come from and how we can make fair and effective change happen. The group that developed the evidence developed a framework to look uh, at the data around some of the emissions and identified these different areas and that's how the work streams were developed. And then people basically worked through them and then everyone came back together um, to share their learning from those but then to focus a little bit around uh, finance and climate action and current policy before deliberating on the recommendations. And at the end we got 81 recommendations coming out along all of those themes but also touching on various social, uh, political and economic aspects of climate change too. Specific. So, um, some of the benefits of having that more specific uh, remit where you're really focusing on a particular aspect of climate change. Um, they can be easier to design to some extent, but you know, don't let that put you off. Um, they enable the full assembly to work on issues together. So, one of the challenges that you saw there uh, with Scotland is because we had such a broad remit and so much potential content to cover, we realised it was just very difficult for the entire assembly to work on absolutely every aspect of that. 
when you are more specific about your issue, it's easier to bring groups together and make sure that everyone is going through exactly the same learning journey. Although, of course, a lot of these are questions around design in any case. Um, benefits are that they do produce a relevant package of recommendations that policymakers can prepare to respond to. Theoretically, they absolutely do, um, but there are some steps that you just need to do as you're preparing for your climate assembly to ensure alignment with the windows that people really have to, to influence strategies and policies and things like that. Um, you are able to identify clear trade-offs and options, typically, and the outputs can just be more tangible for policymakers or um, a little bit clearer for communication purposes externally. Some of the issues. So, this one, I think, is absolutely real. The limited focus can sometimes frustrate participants. Um, I've got examples of this from local and national assemblies where people get in the room, they're asked to focus on a particular aspect of climate change, and they say, that isn't the issue. Why aren't we focusing on this other thing, or why don't we have space to talk about that? So bear in mind, that's just a consideration, and you may have kind of lively civil society or activist groups in your community that may uh, give that challenge to you. Um, limited exploration of the interdependencies. So that kind of connects to that question and a few things I've already said. If you're focusing on one specific topic, people might be really interested in kind of the underlying drivers and the levers that are making that particular thing a problem. And it might not neatly fit into kind of how you've conceived your learning journey for the assembly because they might want to go and talk about systems change and not just talk about mobility, for example. So there's lots of different kind of connected issues and interdependencies um, which may be limited by being more specific. But to be honest, I think that within your design, you can open space up for some of those considerations as you're developing things. So for example, thinking about a particular topic, you could ask people in that room about any impact on issues of fairness or equality, for example. And through conversations like that, you might draw out a, a little bit more information. Um, limited exploration of changes needed across the system. I've talked about that a bit. Um, and it might not satisfy political or civil society calls for action on climate change. So there are a few of the issues uh, with being more specific, but of course there are a few more, and I'm sure they'll come up in the conversations. Um, and just a couple examples of, of being more specific. So uh, in Devon, in their climate assembly, they looked at onshore wind. They actually had three questions guiding that process, but one of those was what should be the role of onshore wind in the Devon Renewable Energy Strategy? And in Poznan and Poland, how to take care of the city's green areas in the context of climate change. They really looked at, at green areas and a really specific aspect. Um, but yeah, again, lots more examples uh, at the back of the room. We can share them later too. So I haven't got loads of time, so I want to move on to approaches to setting the question, because as I mentioned earlier, the question is really important. It's going to communicate what your process is about, and it's going to be a thing that guides people who are participating along the way. A few things just generally about question setting. Uh, first of all, do try and make sure it's a question and not a subject description. Um, I have seen people designing assemblies, and their starting point is to write a paragraph of text before they get to the point. Um, but you, know, you really do need to try and keep what you're asking people to do and to focus on clear and simple, as clear and simple as possible. So not paragraphs of text, something quite short, snappy, to the point. Um, some people think that if there are clear trade-offs, you should embed them in the question, although I do think that is a bit more uh, of a debate. Um, and that you should not include a solution. I mean, I absolutely agree with that, um, because that's really uh, delegitimizing an assembly process if you're suggesting a solution. Um, and don't lead people towards any kind of predetermined answers. So they're just a few, I think, drafting principles when you're putting together a question. Um, and then shout out to New Democracy Foundation uh, and also to the Innovation Democracy Programme in the UK who've put together some information and guidance. I think New Democracy, you've got a, I know you're in the room, a Framing the Remit paper, um, and the folks in the UK have a guide on how to run a citizens' assembly where they dig into setting questions. And I've just put this up on the screen because it was a nice visual, but also it highlights a few points. Um, these two questions up here, I understand from New Democracy, uh, tested quite well uh, and worked quite well when they went out to do an assembly because in that first question up there, <coughs> Yarra Valley Water needs to find a balance between price and service, which is fair for everyone, how should we do this? It started with a really straightforward problem statement, it included a clearly stated trade-off and the question was left open. And a lot of people would definitely advocate for having open questions uh, in an assembly setting as well. And then in the second question, this seemed to work quite well, how should we best spend $2 million uh, to improve our community through the use of infrastructure spending? 
It included a clear parameter, that $2 million. It had a really uh, specific and brief remit, improving our community, and the goal was clearly stated. Uh, and then there was a clear parameter in there, which was around infrastructure spending. So yeah, I do recommend looking at those, those two guides for just some concrete examples as well. But how do you set your question? So a few different ways to do it. I mean, you as commissioning authorities, the people who have been giving a direct mandate, you can sit in a room and you can come up with that question so you can decide it. Or you can involve stakeholders in that process. But I think whatever option you choose, there's absolutely going to have to be consideration and balance of your time and resources to go through this process. And I'm just going to highlight how I've done it with a couple uh, of places where we've involved stakeholders um, or worked with authorities in a different way. Some pros and cons. So some pros uh, are related to you deciding the question is that you can come up with something that directly responds to your challenges. If you're working in a policy setting, you're working within government, you might be able to go and test uh, some of those questions with policy officials and, and political leaders and see what lands. So you, know, you can really set something that you think might have impact and respond to your challenges. Um, but you do risk not setting a question that maybe connects with the public, includes language or words that maybe don't resonate so well. And I've had so many interesting conversations about whether or not we should use words like sustainability in questions, if we should use green in questions. And all of these words have implications for your context that you're working with. So getting those words right does matter. And then involving stakeholders, I mean, there is a potential, and I think this works particularly well, where we're doing assemblies on the initiative or with the uh, support, maybe the provocation of, of activist groups. So we talked about Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion in the UK, and that was a consideration in Scotland, um, was to enhance buy into the process and highlighting things you would have missed. To be honest, I think it's just a good principle to go out and do testing with the public when we're doing engagement and participation work in any case. Um, but, you know, Doing that, that can help also increase some buy-in. Um, but downside is that the question that comes out might not be best to achieve policy impact. It might not be specific enough for the needs that you have as policy officials or people working in those settings to make sure that things have impact. Um, and I think sometimes um, the wording of the questions, some feedback that I've heard from policy folks is that it's just, it's just too big and it's just too broad and it's just really hard to go into uh, settings to try and sell it to colleagues, to try and get colleagues buy into this so that when it comes to the end of the process, we've got our recommendations, we're ready to take action. We have a group of people that are ready uh, and willing to respond. So there's, there's something interesting in that to explore. But of course, you should always start with why. Always start with, why am I doing this process? What is the point of us getting together all of these citizens in a room to deliberate on these issues uh, and try and work from there? And I think a really important part of that is understanding the challenges and doing some scoping of challenges that you have locally. So just thinking about the collaborative approach, how could you do that if you were to maybe involve stakeholders in different ways? And this is just an example of one way that you could go about that, say, in a workshop setting or a series of workshops. Um, so you could start by setting the scene. So if you're getting together some different stakeholders to think about question setting, uh, you need to bring everyone up to speed about why you're planning that assembly. Be really, really clear on that why before you go out and do any communication, to be honest. Um, and that will include what is the political will and initiative for this process, what is the local interest in the process, and what are some of the key drivers. Um, and doing that, you want to bring in some evidence and baseline data uh, as well around some of the, maybe the challenges you're facing. And then you need to move on to understanding the challenges. Um, so what are the key issues that are facing your place? How will this assembly help you to make an impact at them? And uh, this is where things like some guiding principles, like the ones that the Knowledge Network have produced, are quite useful. And I'll just show a slide with what they are um, after this. Um, explore that question or option to do a broad or specific remit. But I think you need to have that conversation in the context of the challenges that you have identified. Because some of your challenges might be about climate issues, but they might also be about perhaps um, maybe political arrest or something else happening out there in civil society where you're getting pressure from, from different groups. Um, so having a specific remit might not satisfy uh, some of those groups that actually you're really taking climate change issues seriously. So you've got quite a few things, I think, to weigh up when you do those, uh, do those discussions, but you need to talk about broad and specific remits and some of the pros and cons in your context. 
Develop draft question options. Um, I think it helps to have a set of options that you can go out and test about rather than just kind of coalescing around one particular idea. And in a workshop setting, very practically, you can do that in drafting rounds where you sit, uh, you look at your challenge statements, you come up with questions that might help you to respond to those, and then you kind of go around the room and get feedback and basically iterate those questions so they get better uh, and more simple and to the point. And then testing and finalizing the questions. So explore your proposal with stakeholders, including policy colleagues, um, before you finalize it. To, again, thinking about the very end when you make those recommendations and you think about impact, is this question actually, do we think, going to get us to a place uh, with whatever comes out of this process, being able to make some change and maybe able to uh, influence the work that we're doing? Um, and this is something that I, I've done recently with a London borough, and interestingly, it ends up being uh, a broad question, broader than I was expecting. Um, but it was essentially, how can we um, tackle change to tackle climate change together? So it was really focusing, um, because that council was only directly responsible for 4% of emissions, they really wanted to include in the question something about how the borough would work together. So that meant that at the end of the process, when the recommendations came out, they had um, some impetus to bring together wider stakeholders to look at how the recommendations could be implemented because the responsible authority themselves couldn't do it alone. So that was really interesting. Um, and they also wanted to include in the question about uh, timelines. So what do we need to do now to enable change in the future so we were able to bring some futures thinking into the process. So for them, the together part the question and the timeline and things like that just meant that they had to have a, a broad question. It's been quite an interesting process to go through and their, their reflections were uh, that it's been much more difficult than they thought to set a question, but the things that were really useful were getting feedback from civil society, their local environmental groups, policy officers, the chief executive of the council and others to help them do that and really give confidence that their question was okay. Um, and in Scotland, um, we ended up with our stakeholder group, so essentially the stewarding group for the process. Um, I think we're talking about governance a bit later, but often when you have a citizens' assembly, you might have a group that's there to develop evidence, and you might have a group of stakeholders that have some kind of connection or interest to the project that might be a steering or stewarding group that are there to give advice uh, and kind of feedback along the way. And in that process, we involved the stewarding group in designing the question, which was the first time I had the opportunity to do that, really. Um, but it was felt essential that the stewarding group did that because there was such a kickback from some civil society groups about the question and wanting to really uh, focus on some kind of the broader and systematic changes, as well as issues of fairness and just transition in Scotland. So we thought actually it was a good idea to involve the group in setting the question. And we went through a process that involved some of these elements, but we went a little bit deeper basically in some of the, um, the political, social uh, and economic issues that were also facing climate change. And we talked a little bit about fairness and how you would discuss that in an assembly setting too. So that was quite interesting. But the point is that you can involve broader stakeholders in question setting. You just need to uh, have a really easy uh, and clear process to do it. Um, and I've just got a few questions that I'll probably leave up here for the discussion about things to ask yourself when you're thinking about remit and when you're thinking about question setting. Um, should we make recommendations on a specific aspect? Do you want to source proposals for a wider series of actions? Are there timing considerations? Should we focus on actions that are not just for you as a government, bearing in mind sometimes your limited capacity to respond, uh, but actually actions that enable wider community action uh, and enable you bringing together a community around recommendations at the end? Um, and I really just want to emphasize that because I think it's a really important part of expectation setting for assemblies. Because often Often what happens is you get into a position where you as a commissioning authority are expected to respond to everything and sometimes you're not prepared for how best to respond when you perhaps don't have the, the kind of power to address some of the issues that come up through assembly settings. So you just really need to think about that uh, at the start. Um, links to current or planned legislation or policy or strategy, baseline data you have available. Um, usually carbon based lighting data is, is quite helpful to have um, and whether or not approaches can really make an impact. That's good because I'm nearly at the end. Um, and then, yeah, just to say again, at the back of the room, lots of guidance uh, around how to go about this. Um, preparing for a climate assembly, the guidance for policy officials. I'm flagging because I um, helped to write that. So if anyone has questions about that specifically, you're welcome to talk to me at any point. Um, but it has got a few points there around mandate setting and remit setting. Um, and then there's this brilliant, uh, bit of uh, guidance as well on guiding principles for setting the remit of a climate assembly specifically. 
Um, and here are some of the principles that they have included in that guidance. It includes um, ensuring you have a remit that fits the context of climate policies, a scope that gives sufficient time to develop recommendations, understand consequences and provide justifications, that you have the authority, um, so the sponsoring authority has sufficient power to act on recommendations, political relevance, receptiveness, societal relevance, timing, dilemmas, legitimacy, ownership and resource efficiency. Okay, that's it. Yeah, great, thank you.